Welcome in. We are college football overtime. Garrett Chapman, Abe Gordon here in a new time slot. Abe, the, the people were listening to us and they just said, hey, we, we need more college football conversations. And, you know, I don't know about you, Abe, but um, I, I, I got pretty excited about that idea. You know, coming in here, we always do our Monday mornings. Now we got to do our Thursday mornings because the good people came to us and said, Abe and Garrett, we need you to do the previews too. It's Saturday mornings and Sunday nights and Monday morning. None of that. That's not enough. No, we need Wednesday and, and Thursday and Friday. And they need as much content from us as possible. And we settled to just do some uh, some previews later in the week. But we are college football overtime coming to you midweek. We're going to get you ready for all the week nine action. Plus, we got to discuss some of these big news items that have come around college football because there's been a lot of stuff happening, Abe Gordon. But Abe, I got to first ask you, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Yeah, look, I'm looking forward to this time next week when we'll actually have the college football playoff rankings oh, yeah. to talk about. And we don't have to deal with what we're about to head into with the discussions we're about to start. Uh, but, man, it, it's we're headed towards another great weekend of college football. I, I, I'll say this, and I know we'll talk about it more in the uh, when we get to around the SEC. For those who know me, I am a Florida Gator fan, so this is obviously one of the most important weekends of the uh, year for me uh, as we head towards a cocktail party. Um, and, and look, when I was growing up, the results went a little bit different than they seem to be going right now, but mm -hmm. win or lose, it, it's an incredible event. Um, you, you know, the SEC's version of the Texas-Oklahoma, if you will, in terms of neutral field, Half the fans one side, half the fans the oh, yeah. other. And so it's always a big one for me, but it's not the only big game this weekend. That's for sure. We'll dive into it throughout the show. Yeah, we've got multiple top 20 matchups. We've got one in the ACC with Duke and Louisville. We've got one out west in the Pac-12 uh, with Utah and Oregon. And I think these are a very interesting matchups that really have national implications, if not just for their conference and who could be representing the programs or those conferences in the conference title games but who could be representing those conferences in the eventual college football playoff? And I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation. And one I have to start with is, is not so much fascinating as it is just something we need to do because college football right now, it has, it has a Michigan problem. And I don't know what's going on with all of this. This is the second time this year that we have seen Michigan run, run into some NCAA violations potentially the first, of course, was Cheeseburger Gate. We won't get in too deep on that. Uh, but Jim Harbaugh, the head coach of the Michigan Wolverine, serves a three-game suspension self-imposed by the University of Michigan as they were getting ready for the season. And it was a bit of a distraction, but, you know, Michigan rolled. They played three, I'd say, lackluster programs, uh, and they won those games by multiple touchdowns, as they should have, whether he was there or not. Now they're getting into the situation where Connor Stallions who is, of course, a, a an assistant uh, for the Michigan football program, has been going around to various potential future opponents. That includes in-conference Big Ten opponents. They, they have 11 of those that he has been seen at. at. Uh, and then he's been to out-of-conference opponents, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, other programs that they had a chance to see in the college football playoff, playoffs. And basically, what he's doing is he is filming the opposing sidelines, and he has one on either side where they're filming those teams. And it's it's not good. It's not good, Abe Gordon. Pipping signs and stealing signs, admittedly, is not illegal. Sending scouts to go steal said signs at a football game that you are not playing in, that is illegal. Well, I'll say this uh, because I don't think it's that big of a deal, only because I presume it is happening all over the country. This is just the poorest example of how to hide it. I mean, there's so many levels of being careless and all that. That The only real question I'm interested in here, Garrett, is what level of knowledge does Coach Harbaugh have of the situation? I think as we get further into the story, I would not be surprised to find out that this has actually been kept away from him. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if he does know about it as well. Um, but that's the real question that I have. I I'm not so bothered by the 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 levels of Michigan's cheating. I, first off, I think it's a dumb rule. 
I think you should be able to go to opponent stadiums and scout teams. I I, I don't care. Well, but, Abe, 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 Abe. Let, let's let's make sure our, our our verbiage is correct here. They're not scouting teams. They're not scouting teams. Yeah, that is scouting. Looking at, going in and, and filming sidelines. It's no different than it's, it's than trying to watch That's a game a against Cadence. Not, I, I totally disagree. We're, we're not going to go back and forth that you're on it, find, but... This is not something that you're going to find. And I'm sure John Fricky and I are going to get into this on Saturday on College Football Game Time on 92.9 The Game, uh, which you can stream anywhere on the Odyssey app if you want to tune in for that. This could be our opening segment just like it is here. And I, I'm sure that we'll have that discussion on Saturday. But look, they do not get sideline access on broadcasts. They do not get sideline access on coaches' film. You have to physically send somebody there to do that. And I, this is not something that no, no, everybody's I agree. doing. I agree it's a different it. type of access. But, but the point is there are people who are trying to figure these out through many different facets. Whether During it's, the game, yes, that's yeah, fine. No, they have, but they even, have, not just in game, Garrett, not just in game. You go back to other – other when you're hearing the, the quarterback bark out the calls. Like there's a level of trying to break that down and figure out exactly what it's saying and how it relates to the play call. I understand what you're saying. And I agree with it. It's not the exact same as that. But but to me, it's not that big of a deal. It, it really isn't. I don't think Michigan is beating Rutgers 40 to 3 or whatever the score was a couple weeks ago because they figure out a couple of calls. And I also think that many more schools are doing this. This to me is like the Astros scandal it was in baseball. MLB has already admitted that the Astros weren't the only school doing it. The issue most people had was they were so blunt and obvious while doing it. There were more subtle ways to cheat. I think the issue here is that Michigan was so out in front of your face with doing it and that it happened in, in such a dumb manner, if we're being honest. I don't blame any program. And I said, I think it's a dumb rule. You should be able to look at this. But I don't blame any program for going out of their way to try and figure this out. But but to not hide it like at all, to have things out in public, like, like you almost deserve to be punished for being so stupid going against what is an NCAA bylaw. Whether you agree with the bylaw or not, like Goodness. myself, it is still yeah. a bylaw and you do have to follow the rules. So from that perspective, I understand it. The only question, like I said, though, Garrett, is just what's the level of Harbaugh's knowledge here? Because if it's coming from him, we've got a real issue. If it's not, yeah. and it's, it, it, and I know people will say, "Oh, every manner of your program, you have to have knowledge of." But there are dark horses, there are renegades. If this is just a guy doing this on his own, I, I just don't care. Well, just go ask Coach Fitzgerald about knowing everything about your program. I mean, the Big Ten and 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 universities have done a lot more with a lot less as far as knowledge or or a smoking gun, if you will. Which I don't think there is a smoking gun right now. However, the, the NCAA claims that it has hundreds or it says hours and hours of film. I, that's just that's the quote that I have from this report. Yeah. Uh, so maybe something does come out. Maybe something does. I, I don't know if there is something that's going to come out or not. Now, if they can just pin all of this on Connor Stallions and fire him and get rid of him, then they'll do that. Yeah. Now, this isn't something that just happened this year. And nope. that's one of the other biggest, bigger things. This has been happening over the course of three years now. This is the third year that it's happened. It also coincidentally coincides with the sudden resurgence of Michigan football. And uh, that's a bit I know strong. I'm, I'm, I'm it's the first time they this got past purely, Ohio this State. Purely, this is purely my opinion now. Like this is purely like alleged and everything else. Michigan was on the brink. All right. I'm just painting a picture. They're on the brink. Jim Harbaugh is about to get fired. Jim Harbaugh was about to get fired from his dream job and likely his last true opportunity to be a head coach at a top program after falling on his face, like the embarrassments that it had had. And then, and then you fail as badly as you do at your, your, your alma mater, if you will. And then you just do what you have to do because all of a sudden you're about to get fired in 2020. So then you start employing ta any tactic that you can, you cut every corner that you possibly can and it works. And you go to a college football playoff and you win a big 10 title. You're like, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to keep doing this. And you keep riding that wave. Uh, the, it, the, the timelines make sense. It's a now, fair assertion, but it also just may be coincidence. It, it, may. it may also but it's be a fair assertion. coincidence. Yeah. Because we need a smoking gun before you can really say whether they did it or not. I kind of believe that they absolutely did it. Now, at the same time, there's no real evidence that, that Coach Harbaugh knew about. Mm -hmm. We don't know that for a fact. I mean, we people have... Use this this 
anecdotal evidence of, of uh, Stallion standing next to the defensive coordinator and offensive coordinator, and they would have a break in the action. And they look over to the other sideline, and like they, that's anecdotal evidence. You don't know what that is. He could just be standing there. He could have a certain specific responsibility at the time. We have no idea. The, and it's very hard for them to actually prove it. And whether or not Harbaugh knew anything about that, I don't know yet. But it's something that's going to happen here soon. Now, I haven't listened in our rundown. We have different teams that could cause chaos over the next half of the season. You can include Kansas State. You can include Missouri, Oregon State. You have the football teams. The NCAA could also cause some chaos. What if they come out and actually do something, if you will, to Michigan and the rest of this team? What they Now, they move slow as molasses, so I don't expect that it, anything is going to happen this year. But what if the college, what if they actually bring out and, and release publicly some of the knowledge that they have? Well, what, how does that affect the college football playoff committee? They've been known, they are about as consistent as, as, well, inconsistent can be. And what if they use that in their rationale later in the season? Oh, well, they were cheating and they were getting more information than they were properly allowed. There are a lot of question marks that come with this. And of course, at this point, I'm only speculating, but this could be a more serious thing. We just got to give it some more time to unravel. I would say this. I think if the NCAA wants to fast forward college football's exit away from it as an organizing program and an entity, they, they would make a statement on this or, or do something in, re, in regards to this. Yeah. Uh, I, I Look, in bowl bans or whatever um, that could come down the road or even, like you said, by the end of this year, I, I don't think they would go as far as to prohibit Michigan from being uh, entered into the college football playoffs. And that's ultimately what you're asking. <laughs> Is this something that could raise to the level where Michigan... See, but they can't, they can't do that because it's they're, the college right. football playoff is also very... It's very important to know this. The playoff is a separate entity entirely than the NCAA. And, 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 and we had... You know, we kind of talked about this today. It, 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 in my eyes, it would actually be funny if they're like, all right, now, if you're like sixth or seventh, you don't get to play. But if you're in the top four, you're good, man. Like, have that. Like, that to me would be like the ultimate, like, here's the NCAA having zero power. It would be like, here's your bowl ban, but also, oops, you made it into the playoffs. So, good luck in your tournament. Like, I mean, that's kind of where I'm at. But, yeah, I, I just, just the real question to me, the longer run question, and I know you're talking about Michigan here, is just going to come down to hardball. Um, is this a situation where he leaves for the NFL now? Mm. It, it, does it rise to that level? Um, if he were going to stay or, or if he doesn't leave for the NFL, would Michigan have to move on? Uh, I, I think moving the NFL is a realistic option now. I, I don't think the NCAA would uh, bring penalties enough to the point where he would have to be fired or anything like that. That's just my opinion. Um, but again, all that's going to come out, as you said, when we get the, the knowledge of how much he actually knew yeah. in regards to what's going on. And for the record, he has denied any knowledge of this program. Do all. you have it? Let, let me ask you this. This is total, like you said, speculation, gut sure. feeling. Do you think he knew yeah, um, think he about knew. this? I think he did. That's that's just my opinion. You know, and like it's it's all alleged activity at this point, and, and I, I can only speculate, but... Yeah, I, ba I based there, on some of the... If it, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck. I mean, it's just that's just kind of how it feels right now with Jim Harbaugh, right? Yeah, wouldn't I, you say? I, I, based on some of the mm. other things I've read over the last twenty four hours, I actually am starting to lean towards this guy may have been kind of operating on his own, um, and, and not that he was solo, but uh, but that he he. I don't know had if, if somebody support. at this capacity could have operated on his own. I mean, he's he's got other people working with him, correct? In conjunction. He has people who are who he's paying to 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 stand on sideline, and maybe that's just a. But but I wonder if it was trying to make a name for themselves. They're all. It was also people. a point to keep it away from Harbaugh. Is what I mean. Not that he was sure, solo. Sure, but it's, that it's there any was operation. a point made to keep it away. Yeah. Yeah. Any black cloak operation, they they want some plausible deniability. I mean, I mean caught, this is right? this is the CIA operating without yeah. the president's knowledge. There's plenty of examples where. After the fact, they have to tell the president, oh, by the way, hey, this we've happened. been doing this and we have this <laughs> intelligence now. And here's what you need to know. I, I mean, you know, you never know to, to what extent it, it, it's comparable to that. No. And, and and that's the other thing is we won't we won't fully know until the, the, the investigation unfolds. And and it's it, at this point, it's a lot of speculation, but it's it's very interesting to watch. And we'll see what ends up happening with all of this. We don't know. 
We don't know. L- let me just ask you this to, to put a bow on this because I know how I feel. Yeah. Do you think Michigan has won games that they otherwise would have lost because of this uh, scandal, if you want to call it that? I think it's also impossible to know right now. Uh, I mean, we don't. <clears throat> a lot I mean, of. I know you don't want to go back through every game and look at all the. Well, ones no, I'm not going to do that. Of like course that, not. We have. Just I, I have. I have your instant I, reaction. Do you do think it's life. risen to the level where it has impacted games to that extent? I. I mean. It's under investigation for a reason. They what they did was illegal, and they clearly knew something. I based off of the, the uh, admittedly anecdotal evidence that exists on the up in the Twitterverse. Take that for what it's worth. Uh, they they knew what signs were coming in, what players were coming in, what plays were coming. Now the Ohio State play that a lot of people have been circulating on the internet, the the one that I texted you and, and John Fricky, they actually scored a touchdown on that play. So take that for what you will, but. I think this is a, it's an ongoing investigation. It's something to follow. It's not something that we need to overreact to just yet. It's worth discussing uh, as we've spent the last 15 minutes discussing it, uh, just because it's, it's one of the best teams in the country, if not the odds on favor to win a national title. Uh, not to mention the fact that they've won the big 10 in consecutive years, and they still have a lot of big games on their plate. One of which, of course, coming against Penn state and, and Penn state is one of those teams right now. We have, I don't know really what they're going to be down the stretch. Uh, they're a team that I expected to be a lot better than what they were on Saturday. And if you saw our last college football overtime podcast, you would have seen that. Um, we, we were a little confused. We were a little frustrated with what Penn State ended up putting out onto the football field. But at the same time, that was just a really good Ohio State team. And they're going to have to face another really good Michigan team on November 4th. Is James Franklin going to be the guy to get it done? Uh, it feels... Very similar to what Georgia was under Mark Richt, a, a team that was perpetually very good, but not quite good enough. The team that would play in the SEC championship game and and have a ball batted down at the the three yard line against Alabama uh, on a chance to and a chance to go to the national title game. It, it's a team that was always one frustrating loss away from playing in that SEC championship game. Uh, it, it was a team that just sort of fell apart when it mattered most and they would beat the teams they were supposed to beat. But then when you go up against the big dog, you're never quite the biggest dog in the room. Is that just life with James Franklin at Penn state? It it is very similar Mm -hmm. and it's very interesting. And and I will say this, and I will admit that I was wrong. When I saw that Georgia was going to fire Mark Rick, I thought it was a mistake. This is a team that was almost every single year, 10 wins uh sometimes more and right on that discussion for the national championship and and they yeah. got very close a couple of times in the mm. SEC title game and didn't get past it and i thought it was a mistake to move on i i i didn't believe that you could bring in a guy that would make a difference obviously i was wrong kirby smart has made that difference and it does remind me of what's going on with penn state there are a ton of parallels mm. right now um, now the difference is I believe that Mark Rick could win a national championship at no point have I believed that James Franklin could win a national championship. A- and so I-, I I'm stuck there now with like, well, look, if Georgia did it here and look where they are now and what they've become, I do think with that example, Penn state does have to consider it. The difference being is there a Kirby smart out there? And I can't pretend to know which great coaches or coordinators or whatever can make that difference. Georgia fans almost immediately zeroed in on Kirby smarts. The guy, there was not a lot of discussion, right? He was the only person who was up for the job. Is there someone like that in regards to an option for Penn state? If they were to move on for James Franklin, if there is, I haven't heard about it. And that, I think, is the biggest difference. It's the old proverbial, grass is always greener, right? For Georgia, it was. But is that the rule or is that the exception? And I think that's the concern is if you you, you move on from James Franklin, where does the program go? You could keep going up and maybe jump over like you're suggesting. It could also go the other way. And you have to be prepared for that as well. You could turn into Wisconsin or Minnesota, or or whoever you want it to be. Yeah, Look, look, you have Nebraska, who is an 8-4, 9-3, 10-2 at its best year's program. 
Um, you have Bo Pelini in charge of the program. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, hey, that's not enough. Example, we need to get yeah. up over the top. And they go it's and a good bring example in the of it going wrong. You're right. son in Scott Frost, who was exactly the prototype of Kirby Smart. He was a, a Heisman type of player for uh, a national championship winning quarterback who everybody loved when he was there. And then he goes off and finds success at a different program. And all the signs are pointing up in Lincoln, Nebraska. And then all of a sudden, the rug is pulled out from under the program, and they have been just face planted into the dirt. Yeah. I mean, look at Mac Brown. Mac Brown was the guy. He won a national championship. And then all of a sudden, he starts winning eight, nine games, and it was it's not enough because you need to get past Bob Stoops every now, every year against at, at Oklahoma. You need to be winning a Big 12 title every year. And you need to, it's unrealistic expectations that have really been the detriment to a lot of those programs. And that you see, they, Texas has only just gotten back to relevancy. It's been 15 years. You could have uh, yeah. said the same thing about Notre Dame for many years. I mean, this is something like, – the difference between a good team and a great team is small. The difference between a great team and the elite teams is even smaller. And there aren't like, – Kirby Smarts and Nick Sabins and, and even Dabo Sweeney's, those guys aren't common. And you need so many things in your camp, as we've seen with Clemson, to go your way. You need that right defensive coordinator. You need the right quarterback. You need the right conference and schedule. There are so many different things that need to go your way. Not to mention health and injury luck and turnover luck and the ball literally an oblong object bouncing your way. It happens. And sometimes it, it bounces against you. And I don't blame James Franklin. He didn't make coaching errors in this Ohio State game. He, and, and largely he didn't do it in any of these other games that people are blasting him for. Like you call him not not you personally, but people call him called him overrated. Well, well, okay. Well, if he's overrated compared to who, he beats the teams that he's supposed to beat. This maybe this is just who he is. Yeah, I was going to say that step below. Th until this year, we really never had the feeling that this the Penn State team was on par with Ohio State or Michigan. At least I, I did. I don't know. No, A lot of people no felt point. that this year, and, and that's why we're kind of raising this hubbub about what's going sure. on now. And understandably so. And look, they still have that chance that you talked about later in the season against Michigan. And They're we'll have to revisit yet. that conversation, you know, if they fall again there. But uh, to me, it's just the risk reward. Uh, I, I mean, are you really re ready to risk your program joining the group behind those guys mm -hmm. as opposed to staying up with those guys and, and continuing to try and catch them at the right time. Hadn't happened yet. Do, again, doesn't mean it never happened. Let's say Mark Rick had stayed at Georgia. I can't sit here and tell you he never would have won a national championship, but I know what's happened since. It, it, and so it, it, well, it, it was, was the stale. Right. That, that program was stale. I, I understand that. And, and you're going to get And there. that's the biggest difference. But, but Abe, that's my difference here. Like this isn't, they aren't necessarily the same stages of their careers. Mark Richt was Mark Richt had played in the title games. Mark Richt had been there, and then and then after a while, it's just like he wasn't getting the funding anymore. And people, you just needed a new message. He'd been there for at the time. So maybe it's not years. still now. Maybe it's next year. But you can't. It might sit be here, in a couple of years. It might be next year because you can't sit here if you're Penn State after this year telling me you're just as good as those two big boys. If mm -hmm. you drop both and then do it again next year, I think we are starting to have that discussion. Yeah, because it, it's quickly becoming a stale conversation. I mean, yeah, the the moment that Mark Rick got fired was was really when they beat Georgia Southern in overtime, and the players celebrated and jumped in the stands and acted like they just won. They they, they locked down the SEC East title or something like that. I, it was an inexcusable situation for them to be in in the first place. And and I'm a Georgia Southern grad. I was cheering the whole time, but look that's not a place that they needed to be in and much less celebrating like they did after the fact. And look, that Georgia program was expecting more of itself. That Georgia program was also a kind of middling underachieving team for the, for I think three years leading into that game. Uh, they had been consistently, Oh, they're like hype is getting up here. Like the, the, it's getting up. And then they would just come crashing down. That's kind of what you're referring to. I think, with Penn State, if they lose some of those other games, which they haven't lost those other games yet. Right. Like last year, like people can point to last year all they want. They lost to Michigan and they lost to uh, Ohio State, but they went 11 and two last year. Like this was a really good football team. 
like by in its own right, it's 11, 11 to two is good. You know, it's just, they, at what point do they feel like they need to get over and get that extra inch? And who is that guy to do it? That you need that answer before you make this decision. Yeah. The timing of who is the right guy, I think does impact your decision. You're absolutely right, Garrett, but I'll say this. They're 0 and one already this year against the big boys. They are. If they go 0 and four, which means a loss to Michigan this year, Lost to Buckeyes, lost to the Wolverines next year as well. I don't think James Franklin is your head coach to start the 2025-2026 season. Mm-hmm. That, that would be my big predict, prediction. If he goes 0 for 3 over the next three against the big boys, I think they do find a way to move on. I just don't know who it's for. Well, see here, they'd be 0-2. and 2 in tw- they, The last win that they've had against either one of these teams came in 2020 during the COVID season. Um, it was the ro- It was the only road victory that they've had against Ohio State and Michigan. Otherwise, they're 1-8 and eight in James yeah. Franklin's games. Yeah, it's not good enough. <laughs> that's not and good that's not good enough. enough. And then that one game came in a COVID season, which I don't know about you, but I'm not really going to hold that. Hold that. Uh, it's right. like me holding water in my hands. The second I move it, it's just it's gone. You know, well, If you cup it properly, it might. You know. <laughs> It'll leak. Um, but that's the other thing. It's like I, this has been the situation for so many programs, and for so many programs, they backslide and fall the wrong direction. Yeah. And, and we that's can't act, just act like – but we can't act like Kirby Smart just sort of like fell into this and he was the missing piece and that's all they needed. He also kind of came in and he brought in top end quarterback play, top end running uh, the offensive line play. He made fundamental changes to the Georgia Bulldogs football program. And you've seen the product of that. And it also took him an extra five or six years before he actually got him over the top and won a national title. I, I the, the one one last thing I'll say is this: if you're going to make the change and and try and get that next push, you have to do it like Georgia did it when the team is nine and three and ten and two. You can't wait till they're a seven and five program before you make that. It's too big of a hill to climb at that point. Yeah, and and we will see specifically with James Franklin because James Franklin, I mean, he's a great coach, very well respected with the program. It doesn't seem like any of these decisions are ongoing or conversations. I should say. Um, I am not 100% sure what's going to happen with it because we still need to watch what he does against Michigan. So he he absolutely still controls a lot of his own destiny. So if he can get that win on November 4th, it becomes all the more important for that program. And like we mentioned at the top of the show, Michigan has some, some issues. They have some things that are swirling, some conversations that are ongoing outside. And what happens if they don't have their guy stealing plays? I don't really know what's going to happen there. But, Abe, I do want to move down to the SEC because we have a ton of great football happening, especially some down in Jacksonville. The world's largest outdoor cocktail party. I know they don't like it when they call it that, but I'm going to call it that anyway because that's a cool name and that's the name that belongs. Um, Georgia and Florida. The Dogs are in a 24-game winning streak, the fourth longest in SEC history. They've also won 17 straight against SEC East opponents, which is also the fourth longest since divisions were created in 1992. Abe, the last person to beat Georgia in the SEC East was this Florida team in Jacksonville back in 2020. I got a lot of thoughts on this game. I know you have a lot of thoughts on this game. Let's start first with how do you replicate the absence of Brock Bowers? What are you doing if you're the Georgia Bulldogs? Well, and I think that's an interesting question because I don't think you focus mm. on doing that. You don't have Brock Bowers, Oscar Delp or Lawson Lucky or or you don't they're not Brock Bowers. Sure. I don't think you can lean on him to six catches and 120 yards and a touchdown like you did mm-hmm. against Auburn, whatever those actual numbers were. I'm probably close, but whatever you get my point. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you've won games. Those might have been his fourth quarter numbers. Honestly. Well, I was talking about it in the fourth quarter. That's right. <laughs> and I just I think you do shift the offense. Uh, now I don't know if it's formationally if you have more slot receivers, which I know has mm-hmm. been presented. If you go with a heavier run game, especially if Kendall Milton's healthy, uh, if you get a Marius Mims back, stuff like that along the offensive line. Uh, I just don't think it looks the same, and, and I actually think that might be a, a breath of fresh air. I, I do think that Lad McConkey mm-hmm. is a problem, and uh, a problem in a good way for Georgia. Uh, I don't want to be confused that he's holding their offense back. Not, not what I think. Um, and I do wonder how, how much more uh, you see him play. And, and mm-hmm. obviously he'd been a slow to return from injury. I think they'd been very careful with him. They knew they had this off week coming. They knew they were going to need him even before the Bowers injury. Um, and, and I think they've been building to him having a large role and that's probably now increased. Um, but I actually go the other way on this Garrett. I, I think the offense you may, 
not see as big of an impact as you think. I think it's up to the defense, though. I don't know how many times we're going to have to say it with the exception of the Kentucky game in which Georgia looked like national championship caliber squad. Why? Because their defense looked like one of the best teams uh, uh, units in the country. I think it's up to the defense to pick up that slack. I think it's up to the defense to not force Carson Beck to score 24 or 27 points. They may not be what they've been in previous years, but I know they're better than what they've shown with the exception of that UK game. I I, th- I need to see them get back to it. It's the defense I want to see pick up the slack. Not Carson Beck, not Lad McConkey, not Delp or Lucky or Milton or Dejon Edwards. No one on the offense needs to pick up the slack. It's the defense in my mind. See, this is one of those situations where I think Carson Beck is really going to shine. He and Dejan Edwards are two guys who I'm looking at on the Georgia offense particularly. Um, Carson Beck, of course, has done a remarkable job. Uh, I mean, he has quietly been one of the best quarterbacks in the SEC this year. Uh, Brock Bowers, of course, like I mentioned, like we started this, this conversation on, and, like he's still on the show because he's the best player in the SEC. Uh, you can make the argument that he's the best player in the country. But, of course, people uh, up in uh, Columbus, Ohio might disagree just because of the, the presence of 18, if 18, you will. baby. But 19 has also done a pretty good job in his own right. 41 receptions, 567 yards. He's been critical to the success of, of the Georgia offense, and especially in games where, you know, you need a spark and you need to get going. And this, I don't, I don't know if this is necessarily a game where they're going to need a spark to get going. It is a, you're going to be fired up and ready to go. You're coming out of the bye week and you're entering the most important month of the season right now. Uh, they're coming into their most important stretch of the season. Of course, every, the next game is always the most important game in college football, and that's how it is in all football. But um, it's 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 Florida, then you've got Missouri, then you've got uh, Tennessee, and you've got uh, Ole Miss and Georgia Tech and everybody else down the road. So this is an important part of your season. So I don't think there's going to be any sleepwalking coming into this one. If Georgia comes out and doesn't look good, it's because Florida is putting them in that situation. And, and really what I want to see from Florida in particular is I want to see if they can run the football because Georgia's good, uh, very good. Uh, like you said, like they're not necessarily what they were in 2021 or in 2022. Uh, they're, they're, they're 38th in FBS and yards allowed per carry. But Florida in particular, in the games that they win, they're averaging 181 yards rushing. I don't think you're going to get to that, but you need to. But what it tells me is you need to establish the run game because in the games that they lose, they're averaging 41 yards. That says to me that this is a Florida team that needs to run the ball. Graham Mertz, of course, is still in the show. He's done a great job. Uh, been one of the best transfer quarterbacks in the SEC this year, and especially one that a lot of people haven't been talked about. I mean, he's quietly one of the best quarterbacks in the country in terms of completion percentage. And I think if he's doing that and like averaging about six, seven yards per completion, which is what his season averages are. I don't think that's going to be necessarily enough, especially against the secondary that doesn't allow things over the top. But if he can get that number up to 10 or 11, that means he's picking up chunk plays. And if Florida can stay ahead of the sticks and get out of third down uh, situations where they're not admittedly very good, they're 113th in red zone efficiency, Georgia is the best in FBS in terms of a third down defense. So Florida, run the ball effectively, complete the passes that you need to, and don't get put into to third and long situations. And you're going to give yourself an opportunity in this football be, football game because, look, Georgia's going to want to come out here and punch you in the mouth. Asian Edwards, they, they have it on film. You saw what they did against Kentucky. That is what Georgia, a blind man can see what you what you were going to want to do in this football game. You want to run the ball and you want to pound it down their throat. Doesn't help if you're if that offense can't even reach the field. And I think it all comes down to what that offense does for Florida. Well, a couple of things here that you mentioned, and, and look, it's aside. Let, let's skip the fact that Georgia's a better team in, sure. in this. Let, let's look at what each team does, and it's just a bad matchup on both sides of the ball. Like you mentioned, Florida needs to run the ball. I totally agree with you, but we also remember what Ray Davis faced against that Georgia defense after running rampant on on Florida, and, and it goes the other way too. Dejon Edwards, I agree mm-hmm. with you. Without Brock Bowers, do you lean heavier on this run game? Well, we remember Ray Davis running for 280 yards or whatever the number was, three touchdowns against Florida. So yeah. it's not a good matchup. You mentioned Georgia's secondary. The extra yards may not be there. Graham Mertz has been very good at taking care of the ball. I think he's got like 15 or 16 touchdowns, only two interceptions, something like that. 
you, you know, that's a big key to Florida is uh, efficiency on offense, stuff yep. like that. I just think it's a bad matchup for Florida. What Georgia does well on offense, what Georgia does well on defense, that, that counters what Florida is going to try and do on both yep. sides of the ball. I, I think ultimately that becomes a problem. Now, the, the great equalizer, as we mentioned, Graham Mertz has been very careful with the ball. Not as much for Carson Beck, who's gotten a little bit looser with it since he's gotten a little bit more comfortable in that mm -hmm. Georgia offense. I think he's got to dial that back down and, and limit those as well because uh, empty possessions, turnovers that give the, uh, the opposing teammate plus field position, stuff like that in this sort of game can get you. I will say this. Florida is good enough if they have a good day that they can win this game. Uh, th th this is not a situation where it's like George is facing Vanderbilt and there's no real path. There is it. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting they're pulling an upset, but there is a path to victory here. And I, and I think that's what makes this game so interesting to me. Th this is a lot more of on the right day. They can get you and um, we'll have to see how it plays out Saturday. But it, it's just one of a, 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 a few games in the SEC yeah. that really have my interest. Yeah, yeah, and and of course this is the uh, the three thirty CBS special. Uh, last time that we're going to see this game on CBS, so take it in, enjoy it, and relish these opportunities because of course it's going to the Big Ten next year, and uh, I don't know many people who are super happy about that, and uh, I know that this guy is not in particular. But another game that I'm looking at in particular, South Carolina and Texas A and M. Can anybody help Spencer Rattler? Abe, I, I, I am so frustrated watching this team play. They. This kid is so talented. He is so talented. And he's just getting no help. They are allowing a pressure rate, rate that is 121st in FBS. Now they're facing an aggressive front seven. That's I was going to say, you think it's up. going up or down against oh, a &M. boy. Texas A&M. And, and not to mention the fact that you have two head coaches who are receiving a little bit of outside noise. Shane Beamer, of course, breaks his foot after the Florida game two weeks ago, which is just the, the weirdest thing. Like I, I'm sorry, you're a... I love the passion. I do. It's just kind of who Shane Beamer is. And I appreciate that part of him. But at the same time, why are you breaking your foot? Because you're kicking something out of frustration. That's a little childish. You know, I will admit, but you can tell he's, he's kind of let the, the outside noise in a little bit and he's hearing the frustrations. Same can be said for Jimbo Fisher. So these are two coaches who really want to win this game. Well, uh, one, one quick comment on Spencer Rattler. I, I, I don't remember who I saw uh, post it, but someone said, that this guy is going to get taken in the NFL. People aren't going to realize how good he is, and he's going to be a star. A yeah. And I tend to agree with you watching their game. You know, obviously, as a Florida fan, what happened a week ago. And, and you're right. He, he's he got no help, and, and he may be a much better quarterback than even we know uh, from what he does at, at, at South Carolina. And, and the other thing is, and, and this is kind of like a mini bold prediction, um, Texas A&M loses this game. This is the last home game coached by Jimbo Fisher. Um, they're at Ole Miss after this. They're going to lose that game, and he's out. Uh, I, I really Ouch. believe – now, I'm not suggesting they are losing this game. If I had to pick it, I wouldn't go that way. But if South Carolina finds a way, and if Jimbo Fisher loses this game at home, this might be his last home game as head coach uh, of Texas A&M. Mm. So, um, yeah, that, I think he's much closer to uh, being fired than Shane Beamer is, but – you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I will make a note. Um, Texas A&M is playing. The, the offense has been kind of struggling a little bit. The South Carolina defense is probably the worst in college football, or certainly the worst in power five. You can make an argument. They're 115th in yards allowed per play. Like we talk about USC and like, in, like any, any game you play, the USC defense is a get right game. You know, this is kind of one of those get right games in the SEC. So I'm very interested to see what he does there, but, Texas A&M also plays a lot better at home. They're 0 2 on the road. They're 3 and 1 at home. Yeah, I'll see what they can do. I, I'll believe it when I see it when South Carolina goes on the road because South Carolina is another one of those teams that just finds a another gear at home. And I think after last weekend's debilitating loss, the fourth, uh, it just all of these just they got smoked on Saturday by Missouri. The week before that, it's just the debilitating. Uh, multi like double digit comeback win in the fourth quarter from Florida. Yeah, I think this city, the season's already been flipped on its head. Uh, there's you're just you're, you're at this point just playing for pride and i don't know if that's going to be enough at the end of the day when you're growing into one hundred five thousand people screaming uh but speaking of which i want to i want to flip over to to auburn 
not exactly 105,000, but sometimes it certainly feels like 105,000 at Jordan Air Stadium, which is where Mississippi State is going to find itself on Saturday. Is Zach Garnett coaching for his job right now? Uh, uh, through the rest of the season, I can see that. I don't think this is a if you lose on the road to Auburn, then then we're moving on situation. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, I. I See, I have a tough time just because where that program is and what they've been through, I, I kind of wonder if the leash is a little bit longer than it would be at other schools. Yeah. Um, so so I, I would lean towards no, um, but but it, it's, it's tough to tell. Uh, my takeaway from this game is just the Hugh Freeze thing. Like, you're coming in to build this program and kind of reestablish what has been a storied Auburn side. This is the sort of game that you have to win, even in year one. And there's just no excuses. Um, and that look, that doesn't mean he's coaching for his job either. That's not what I'm suggesting. But uh, this is a game that that I mean, if Hugh Freeze is the right hire, they win this game, right? Like, like it's it's pretty simple. And, and I guess it doesn't mean like they couldn't go on to do great things. But like th- this is a game he has to win at home against Mississippi State, uh, a program that's really reeling. You have to win this game as you're on the rise. Yeah, and this is an Auburn team that's still searching for its first conference win. They're 0-4 in conference play. They're reeling right now, having lost four games in a row. Granted, to four really good teams. Why? Yeah. I think it's that you have uh, they have the loss at Texas at Texas A&M. You have LSU, Georgia, and Ole Miss last week. Um, not in that order, of course, but <laughs> we'll see. But um, I, I think Auburn. This is a game that Auburn should win. I expect them to come out and get a win in this game. And I want to see Hugh Freeze get his first one as the head coach of Auburn. Now, I want to move along to two other teams who I think are are really playing for their lives right now, uh, playing for their seasons, if you will. Tennessee and Kentucky. Tennessee is it, or excuse me, Kentucky is a team that wants to run the football, right? Ray Davis is a guy who's probably one of the best running backs in the SEC. He's had one of the best seasons of anybody in the conference. But now you're running up against a Vols defense that also likes to play against the run. They're 13th nationally in yards per carry allowed. I think this is strength versus strength. I think you have two quarterbacks in Joe Milton and Devin Leary who are trying to get right and figure something out. Joe Milton admittedly played a pretty good game on the stat sheet, but I think with him at the helm, they are a little bit limited. And I think when you you also factor in Nico, the backup quarterback, the five-star kid who's sitting on the bench, who's the proverbial future of the Tennessee football program, at what point do we see him? So maybe we see a little bit of the pressure start to come to the front. Maybe he starts pressing. Maybe he starts making some mistakes because Kentucky is not the easiest place to play. I know it's not necessarily the most raucous or crazy place, and it probably won't find itself on any top five lists of the most dangerous places to play in the country or even in the conference. But it's not as easy as you would think. And it's 7 o'clock, and, and uh, Coach Stoops has already promised that his guys know how to drink some beer. So we'll see what they can do on the nightcap with uh, with Tennessee. Yeah, it, it's two programs that are very disappointed right now. Uh, Kentucky brings in Devin Leary. Obviously, Will Levis heads to the NFL. They bring in Devin Leary, and he has not been what any of us thought he would be ba- based on coming from the ACC and how good he looked yeah. there. It just, for whatever reason, it it has not worked out there. And so they've been very disappointed. Ray Davis has won them a couple of games single-handedly, including that Florida game. Um, And then you look at Tennessee, as you mentioned, Joe Milton, they had high hopes that he would slide right in for head and hooker. And and that hasn't been quite the same either. And um, look, I'll I'll be honest, this might be it for Joe Milton as well. I I mean, if you're going to start Nico at any point this season, they play UConn next. That, that's the only chance you have to kind of get him some work. So uh, Joe Milton should be playing like his career at Tennessee is on the line because it actually might be. Uh, I tend to think Tennessee is a better overall team, more well-rounded, and, and they can win yeah. this sort of road game. But um, look, they had a real tough time against the Florida Gators, and, and Tennessee's difficult. Uh, they're beatable, but they're difficult. So – um, it, it's going to be a very interesting one. This might be the second best game in the SEC of the weekend, though. I, this is probably the one that's caught my eye the most. Yeah, outside this is of a, the cocktail party. No, certainly. This is a this is a, certainly a sneaky good game. Tennessee, like you mentioned, plays very poorly on the road. That's uh, both of their losses this season have come there, and I I really want to see how they respond after getting shut down like they did last week in the second half. I mean, of course you 
you're riding a 21 to seven halftime lead. And then that just eviscerate, it just get evaporates. Not a, it got eviscerated in the second half, but the, the lead itself evaporated and Alabama goes on just a scoring frenzy. And they, they, for everything that they seemingly figured out in the first half, everything falls apart in the second half. And I, I want to see how they respond coming in early in this game. And I think that's really where we're going to see what Tennessee team we're going to see yeah. uh, in this whole contest is, is what are they in the very early goings of this game? And so if I'm Kentucky, I'm trying to get the ball first. I want the ball first and I'm trying to establish the run and I want to run down their throats because if I can do that and open up the drive, it's the same thing. What happened, what they did against Florida. Yeah. I say, if you play like you did against Florida, if you play like that and you day. play like yeah. your hair's on fire and your season's on the line, which I think they will. And I think both teams will be doing that admittedly. I think Kentucky has a very good and, and we're shot coming off a game for game. Tennessee's defense where they gave up a boatload of yards to the Alabama run game. So yeah. it, you know there, there's some reasons to believe you can have success against that front. Yeah, and and this is also a situation where uh, I, I don't was was Kentucky who did Kentucky play last week? Did they, did they are they coming off of a bye? I just want to go double check this just off the top of my no yeah they're coming off of a bye. Um, they had the the game against Missouri which was just a disaster, uh, but. I was looking at the EPA. Like I think I don't know who does this. Bill Conley, I think, does this. But if you look at the actual expected outcome of the game, they weren't as far as you would have expected. The scoreboard, the scoreboard didn't fully tell the whole story, if you will. You mean in that I Missouri think, game? Uh, yes. Yeah, that because a lot of that's because of the turnovers. lead they jumped out to, though. And it's turnovers and it's weird yeah, they, things. I mean, that they were up in 14 game. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And so weird things happen in games like that. And I want to see how Kentucky responds, but they've had the benefit of the bye week. And whenever you play a super physical game like you did against Alabama. Yeah, good point. Speaking, you feel it the next week. A little hangover, sure. And you have a little bit of a hangover, especially with the way you played in that second half. So I think the pressure's on both of these teams. I want to see who steps up and uh, responds in this one. The last one we're going to get to with the SEC before we move on. Vanderbilt and Ole Miss. Ole Miss showed me something good last week. I will say that. And I think I want to see this again this week. This is a, I mean, this is, they're going to traipse over Vanderbilt. I think they uh, they should just continue to roll on their way to a New Year's Six Bowl. Yeah, I, the the only thing I'll have to say is they are gearing up for a matchup with Texas A and M, and and this is Vanderbilt's just simply not good enough for this to be a trap game. If we're being honest, um, that would have been my concern, but it, it, it's a pretty decent opponent for you to work your way up and build some confidence yeah. heading into that A and M game. So uh, I, I'm with you <laughs> in, in regards to Ole Miss. I, I look for them to really. Um, have a comfortable time let's put it that way uh in this game before they they head to next week's game against uh texas a&m yeah if we were if we were going to talk about a trap game in particular it was probably going to be last week against auburn uh and they showed out in a big way <clears throat> they control the game they control the clock they control the crowd but more important than anything um but hey i do want to move on to the acc because this is one of our top 20 matchups it's louisville and it's duke and last time we saw duke they were reeling after playing a an admittedly pretty good football game against a, a a very good Florida State team on the road in a tough environment. Louisville also was on the road in a tough environment against Pittsburgh, and they got punched in the mouth. They didn't respond very well. I'm very interested to see how these two teams respond in a big spot because I will admit here, these are two teams who still very much control their destiny in the ACC. You have a two-loss Duke team, but – but ah, that other loss is Notre Dame. You're nailing all the points. So they're three and one in the ACC. Now you after the after the North Carolina loss last week. There you go. They are right there in the thick of things. Both of these teams control their destiny. And and look, Duke still plays North Carolina, so they could absolutely still play their way into the ACC title game. But first, you got to step through Louisville, a team that's coming off of a bye week. And Duke also doesn't have Riley Leonard potentially. He's considered day to day by Mike Elko the head coach of the Duke Blue Devils. Uh, I think if he plays, I'd be very surprised. Uh, if he doesn't play, either way, it's gonna, still going to be Jordan Waters and Jaquez Moore who are going to need to shoulder the load for Duke. Yeah, you, you brought a lot of the storylines that I really appreciate about this game to the forefront already. The, one of the losses was Notre Dame. doesn't count as a conference loss. Right. UNC's loss a, a week ago opens things back up for these two teams to have another run at Florida state. It's a very exciting game. It's a very important game yep. in this conference. Uh, look at no point did I think I'd be saying, uh, you know, the week nine matchup between <laughs> Duke, Duke and Louisville, Louisville is going to be an important game in the ACC week 10, excuse me. Um, but here we are. 
Uh, is it week 10, week nine? Week nine. I, dude, I week can't nine. count, man. Week nine. Uh, but here we are. That's why I work in radio. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, <laughs> can we get the NFL and the college to have some sort of combined week set up? Because I got to do one for this and one for that, and then I just lose count. Oh, anyway, uh, I am very excited about this game. The fact that it does matter, the fact that it does mean something is awesome. I just wish, like you said, we had Riley Leonard. That does not mean that Duke can't win this game without him. I, you, you were all over it a week ago. That Duke defense is going to be able to keep them in this game, in my yeah. opinion. Um, but uh, I think Riley Leonard is, is such a difference maker, and they they have so many offensive struggles if they don't have him out there being the playmaker that he is. So hopefully he finds a way to get uh, to get in there. Hopefully the like last week, uh, it, somehow he miraculously starts the game. But um, yeah, you you knocked it right on head. This is a game that now matters again. For, for the race to the ACC title game because UNC dropped the ball a week ago. And and that has made this game uh, even more exciting than it would have been a standalone as a top 25 matchup. Yeah, and, and I, this is an interesting game for multiple reasons for me too because I think Duke is a better football team, uh, but they're also on the road for cons- in, in, in a second consecutive week. Without their starting and- quarterback. Without your starting quarterback, yeah, which is admittedly an extremely tough spot to be in against a team that against a team coming a off of a bye. Who was watching you lose yeah. on TV last week? So, I mean, maybe they had somebody at the game. I don't even know. <laughs> but look, this is a this is a tough spot for Duke to be in. But this is one of those spots where you appreciate having a really good defense and, and head coach and head and coach. a good head coach. Yeah, and one thing that we've seen about Louisville in particular, <clears throat> excuse me is that Jack Plummer and Jamar Thrash and uh, and Jawar Jordan and, like, these guys, they like they like the big plays. They love big plays. You know one thing that Duke doesn't give up a lot of? Big plays. So I think that's really the biggest situation in this game is, is uh, can the Duke offense lean on Jordan Waters and Jaquez Moore enough, the running backs, to kind of take the load off of the defense and give them an opportunity to breathe? Because that's not something that happened against Florida State last week, and that's ultimately the reason that they lost that you could point to Riley Leonard. And I think that would be perfectly fair. And I think that actually played in a massive role in this game. Of course, you lose your quarterback for a full quarter and a half that matters. But if you're able to do that and keep your, your defense off of the field, I think that's really important, especially in this kind of game where Florida or excuse me, where Louisville likes to play quickly and score on big plays. And they've done that effectively throughout the entire course of the season. Real quick. I want to, I'm going to fly through some of these other games here. Syracuse at Virginia tech. Any thoughts on that one? It's just popping off tonight, man. I'm I'm looking to see if Syracuse can get back on track. You know, at the start of the season, it looked like they would be uh, at least a formidable side, uh, you know, but now three straight losses, Clemson, North Carolina, Florida State. I, I can understand why they lost those three games. Let's just see if they can get back on track on the road on a Thursday night. But, uh, yeah. UConn and Boston College on Saturday. Boston College, of course, coming off of the big win over Georgia Tech. Castellanos is the real deal, man. That quarterback is a bowling ball and then uh, Robichaud, a guy who I had to learn quickly how to spell his name because he was also a bowling ball. He had a lot of big plays. Both of those guys were, were honored this week as ACC Players of the Week on their All-10 team or all whatever, All-11 team. I think that's what they call it. I'm not sure what, exactly what they call it. I just know the ACC honored these guys, and, and for good reason. They had big weeks, and now they're taking on a UConn team that they really shouldn't have any problems with. Clemson and NC State, that's another very interesting game. Because historically, Abe, this is a game that four of the last six have been decided by 10 or fewer points. Plus, NC State's coming off of a bye. They're in a huge spot at four and four with a lot of very difficult games down the stretch. They need to win this game. Yeah, they definitely do. Uh, And Clemson just continues to reel after what what happened a week ago. And and I'll be honest, I was very frustrated with the comments of Dabo Swinney post-game uh, where he essentially threw his quarterback under the bus. And I don't care if Cade Klubnik ran the wrong play or not. You protect your guy. Yeah. You protect your guy. And so I'm very frustrated. I'm tired of Dabo's act. Um, it, look, I'll, I'll have a rooting interest in this one because of that. Um, but but uh, look, they, straight up, they, they're probably the better team, even with the bye, even being at home. I would expect Clemson to be able – to uh, take care of business. Yeah, I'm, I've grown increasingly frustrated with Dabo Sweeney. Yeah. In particular, I, I know that winning is very hard in this sport. Uh, the dude was 
I, I want to be careful with what I say here. It was unnecessary. It was unnecessary. He is he is he has since made some unnecessary comments multiple times. And sometimes it's best to keep your mouth shut. Sometimes it's best to shoulder some blame. Sometimes it's best to just not say anything at all. You know, and this is one of those situations where you know you probably should have said nothing. Um it doesn't I mean or just look, certainly don't say that. Don't bury your quarterback, you know, yeah. the, the the sophomore player who's 20 years old and yeah. you're a, a full grown adult. I mean, like Gun Steve, like Gundy said, I'm a man, I'm 40, right? Talk about me. Dabo Sweeney should have taken a note out of his playbook on or after the game. But I will say one thing more thing about this football game, talking specifically about the football. NC State isn't good at a lot of things, but one thing that they are very good at is stopping the run. Clemson relies on the run. They're also on the road. They haven't played well on the road, Abe. And I think if NC State can come in here and just do most of their things okay, play mistake-free football on offense, don't hand the ball over, you know, uh, don't don't give don't give them turnovers, don't make sloppy plays, because just muck it up, make it as ugly as possible, run the ball, make the screen passes, do whatever you need to do and then stop the run on defense, I think you have a shot just because this Clemson team has shown that it's it's got some distractions off the field. Yeah. And I think they start with the head coach. Um, he's made the story about himself one too many times, and I think it's starting to, to bite him in the rear. Uh, but, of course, that's going to be a different discussion for a different time. I do want to talk about Florida State, the overwhelming favorite in the conference. They have a road trip to Wake Forest. Uh, coach Clawson, of course, is going to have something prepared for these guys. Co- Dave Clawson's one of the better – schemers in the ACC. He's a great head coach, great X's and O's guy. And he generally plays well at home. This is a team that hasn't had a great season. They've kind of fallen off after losing their starting quarterback, Sam Hartman, to Notre Dame. But they're still a pretty formidable team. They're a team that knows how to play good football. They have a good offense. But can they hold up against Florida State? Yeah, and Wake Forest is on their third quarterback of the season. Santino Marucci uh, had a great showing in a last-second win against Pitt uh, a week ago and threw a touchdown with seven mm-hmm. seconds left to put them over the top. And I know we're, we're going to talk about Pitt and Notre Dame in a moment. And that's that, that that's the other side of this, but uh, Wake Forest has got a little bit of momentum, but unfortunately that's Florida state on the other sideline. Yeah. And it's just going to be a, a, a really tough go for them. Uh, I, I think this is a game. Now, the one thing you want to say is you don't want this to be a lazy performance from Florida State I I I think they are that weird team that has got some really good quality wins but people just aren't believing in them so we're in another situation where they're coming off a pretty impressive performance and and you could talk about game flow and all that a week ago against Duke where they should blow out their opponent they want to stamp themselves into that Michigan Georgia Ohio State Washington discussion you do that by blowing out your opponent. And, and I know the margin of victory and style of points and all that crap is supposed to not matter, but it does. And uh, it's just an opponent I want to see them handle and handle well. Four touchdowns or larger needs to be the margin here. Go get it done. Whoa. They Whoa. Should, or should they not? I mean, be, be honest. Should they not? Whoa. I, I mean, look. They you certainly right. can because they're good <laughs> enough to do that, Abe Gordon, right. but I'm not going to sit here on this podcast in good faith and say that they will. I think that's a different thing entirely. But Florida State has a Florida State's the best team in the conference, and I, yeah. I think they need to show it on Saturday. Yeah, there you go. Way that's it. all I'm asking. Notre Dame is also a really good football team. They they just came off of a they're off of a bye week. The last time we saw them, they were taking down USC in pretty dominating fashion. They kicked them in the mouth and then did it again and then ran over them for for good measure. You know, like they say in uh uh, uh, zombie land, the, like one of the rules, right? Yeah, you know, like double take, right? Double yeah, tap, whatever. double tap, double tap. So that's exactly what they did to USC. I think they're in a really good spot against a Pittsburgh team that, like you said, is on the other end of the stick here. Uh, Notre Dame is a really good football team. They're playing at home. Uh, is it, they got some tough sledding out here for Pittsburgh. Yeah, I agree with you. The, the way things went with Pitt, um, Last week, uh, giving up a, a game-winning touchdown to a third-string quarterback with seven seconds left. There's just not much rebound, uh, to be honest. Now, I will say this, because you know how much I love the idea of a trap game. Notre Dame is at Clemson after this game. I know they're coming off a bye, but they are at Clemson after this game. So it's just it, if you're going to have a trap game, 
th- th- this would kind of have the makings for it. Um, but uh, with all due respect, I just think they're way too good mm-hmm. that even if they're sleepwalking through this game, they'll handle business. Abe, I see what you're saying. I I, I just don't think it's going to be one of those kinds of. Games. I know. I don't think so either. But you know, Mark, I got to point out all the week. possibilities. If this was if this was between USC and Clemson, then yeah, I would agree. But you're coming off of a bye week. Um, that I think you're going to be fine, and I think Notre Dame's going to be rested and ready to come into this game. And Pittsburgh is Pittsburgh's reeling. I'm, I'm not a big believer in what they're doing right now. I, of course, I picked them against Louisville. That's really where they peaked, and then it's been mostly it's been hot and cold for Narduzzi's group. Uh, speaking of hot and cold, Virginia got really hot on Saturday over North Carolina. <laughs> Yeah, just in probably one of the most inexplic- inexplicable games of the college football season, they they just sort of beat North Carolina. <laughs> and it's, it was just a crazy football game. Uh, Amari and Hampton got taken out of the game. They they uh, he only touched the ball five times, I think, in that second half, which is just a wild thing. But we're not talking about North Carolina. We're talking about Virginia. They're on the road at Miami, another team who had a big win last week. They take down Clemson, and and I will say this about Miami. They are one of my more interesting wild card teams for the rest of this season because this is not a team that's going to be competing for a college football playoff. They, they they've shown that they lost to Georgia Tech. They they already have uh, uh, the loss to to North Carolina. The the bad debilitating loss to North Carolina, but they only have two conference losses. They still play Florida State and they still play Louisville. This is a team that could absolutely sneak their way into an ACC title game or at least into the conversation. So not not all is lost for Miami, and they showed it last week against Clemson and a huge goal line stand uh, just to finish up that game. Now they get a Virginia team that's coming off of a, a probably the biggest win of Tony, not probably, the biggest win of Tony Elliott's career at Virginia. And I, I think that this is a big spot for both of these teams, but Miami is the better football team, and I think they're going to show it. Yeah, and the other thing is they're supposed to get their quarterback, Tyler Van Dyke, back. Yep. Let me remind you, they won 28-20 in double overtime with Emory Williams playing the yep. entire game. They they did not have Van Dyke against Clemson, so he comes back to an offense that uh, obviously he slides back in for quarterback. Should be pretty confident mm-hmm. based on on how that game went uh, against Clemson. Uh, look, I think Virginia was – it was a nice one-off for them. I, I don't think that's a, a level of momentum they can carry – uh, into Miami. And you're, you're right. Miami is going to be very interesting because that Florida state game coming up in a couple of weeks, um, you know, if Miami gets some, some positive feelings in that forward momentum, um, they could throw a whole wrench into the college football playoffs right then and there. Well, maybe not in the college football playoffs, just no, as, I mean, if they were to be the ACC, not, uh, no, well, which, they would, I mean, I guess admittedly could do it. I if mean, they would be Florida know. state, I think it throws a wrench because Florida state yeah. wouldn't be in the discussion. I mean, yeah, yeah, not exactly for right. themselves, not for they themselves. They do play, so they do play Florida state. They could play Florida state twice because they could also play their way into the ACC yeah. title game, yeah. which then uh, that would just be a complete antithesis to what we've seen from Mario Cristobal in Florida state so far this season. But, what spurred a lot of that animosity, I guess, down in uh, in Coral Gables was the loss to Georgia Tech. And they're also playing another ranked team on Saturday, fresh off of the loss to Boston College, a game that they really got out physical in, I would say. Um, Boston College, I'm not going to say they wanted it more, but they they dominated the line of scrimmage. This is a well, let me, let me jump in. Let me jump in here and let, the, let you break down the game because I want to hear what you have to say more than what I've got to say on this. Sure. Game, because this is another game. And look, North Carolina is looking for a rebound after what happened last week and all that stuff. But th- this is another game for Georgia Tech at home. And, and I have no explanation. I know you've tried to dive into the details, but I don't know what's going on with this team in home games versus on the road uh, in the Weird. ACC. So, so. Look, this is a home game for Tech, which I now have no belief in, no trust in, no expectations in uh, against a North Carolina team that is better than them. So y- you tell me what, what I'm looking for here and why it's just not what it needs to be in home games for Brent Key. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is because it's it has been consistent with Brent Key. Is when he's on the road, as, as a road dog in the ACC, I think he's 4-1, he's and one, uh, which is inexplicable. Because then you flip and, and come around on the, at home, and I think he's one in four or something like one in five or zero so, oh in four, I believe, actually is a home favorite against the against it. He's one in five against FBS opponents, I believe. And I'll go double check that number in just a second here. But I tweeted it out for my personal Twitter page after the uh, the Boston College game at Chichap ATL. If you want to go give me a follow, 
Uh, I have all the Georgia Tech coverage that you could ever want because, well, of course, I'm a 24-7 beat writer for the Yellow Jackets. Um, but look, this is a game that Georgia Tech needs. They need it, especially after last week. They fall to Boston College in a game that I thought that they were the better football team. Uh, they just throw interceptions. Haynes King can't stay clean. Uh, for whatever reason, he's kind of getting gunslingy, and he's throwing the ball down the field. He had three interceptions, including a pick six on Saturday. And ultimately, I think it's it comes down to their inability to run the football. They're very hot and cold in that regard. I want to see what they can do on the ground against North Carolina. But this is a really, really difficult spot because – for whatever reason, too, like this is another one of those weird stats. Georgia Tech is 2-0 and in the last two years against North Carolina. A ranked North Carolina team, 2-0. And I think this is a different set of circumstances here specifically because Virginia, obviously, they jumped on the Tar Heels last week. North Carolina is playing for their, their playoff lives, at least their ACC yeah. title game lives. This really wasn't the case last year. This was a team that was just sort of coasting and just playing at a good level. and. Uh, that's when Georgia Tech came in and kind of punched him in the mouth last year and played a physical brand of football that sort of jumped on him. But for whatever reason, Georgia Tech seems to play better. They play up to their competition, but then they also play down to their competition. And I think that just comes down to consistency. It comes down to a culture. It comes down to the head coach. And I think Brent Key is looking to establish the depth in the, in the actual talent that exists at Georgia Tech. But as far as the consistency goes, I think that's a really important step. And I want to see what they do after the way that they lost last week, where I feel like they got out physical by Boston College, who a team that I don't think is a better football team by any by any means, but it's one that I think that they should have won that game, but or at least been not as beat quite as bad. Uh, but Abe, I do want to move on uh, because quickly because we're uh, about sixty six minutes into this podcast. I know we love talking college football, but we're going to quickly go to uh, a couple of the big games across the country. I start. I want to start first with Oregon and Utah, which admittedly, I think could have been our college football game time game of the week. Of course, like I mentioned, every single Saturday morning, 8 o'clock till noon on Sports Radio 92.9, the game. Find us anywhere and everywhere on the Odyssey app. But this is a game that has massive, massive implications. Utah is a juggernaut at home. They've won 18 straight games in Salt Lake City. They've lost. They've won 29 of the last 30 in Salt Lake City. But this is also a team in Oregon that's not exactly what you played last week. USC has its issues on defense. They have some pretty glaring issues on defense. However, this Oregon team, this Utah offense, I should say, this Utah offense is not, that was not the one that's going to get it done against this kind of Oregon team. What say you? Well, it's a couple interesting things. And I want to start here in regards to Oregon. It is not your birthright to rematch with Washington in a Pac-12 title game. You got to get through this schedule and it's a tough one. And this is a very tough game against a team that has been playing for the Pac-12 championship more often than it hasn't. In, They've won the three past, straight. Yeah, in, in, in the past recent years. And I will say this uh, about Washington. They have ruled Cam rising out for the remainder of the season. I actually think that allows them to take steps forward in their offense. It they isn't this on. mindset. Exactly. This isn't that mindset of we're waiting for our guy to get back. No, no, this is what you got, and this is what you're going forward with. Uh, and, and I was shocked, to be honest, with, with what they were able to do offensively a week ago, even against a porous USC offense. I just Utah had not shown me, in my opinion, that they were a team that's going to be scoring 30 points a game. Uh, I know they did it against Cal, um, but that, you know, with the exception of Weber State early in the season, they hadn't reached the 30 point mark. They have now done it in back to back weeks you wonder if something's clicking there because with the defense that they bring and you know they bring that defense uh if they have an offense that can even come close to matching that it's going to be a tough game for Oregon who we already know brings a good offense yeah. brings a good defense as well so the the fact that you've moved on from cam rising the, the the fact that you you maybe have a more defined game plan of what you're going to do offensively uh, I, I think is really important. Bryson Barnes did not split reps a week ago. Bryson Barnes is your quarterback. <clears throat> 235 yards, three touchdowns last week. Again, it's against SC. You can make your comments. And then, every game's um, a good every every time every time you play USC, it's a get right game. Uh, and, and then I will also leave you with this in regards to Utah's offense. And I know this is your guy. Yeah. Um, but 
moving Vaki, and I know he's still playing a little bit in the secondary defensively, but having him become such a huge part of your offense the past two weeks has also been part of that overhaul. He's not going to be the guy this week. Or you're not, not riding with him? No, 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 no. This is not. This isn't USC that you're playing this week. This isn't some hapless bunch who I don't even know if they watch film. They're that bad. No, I, look, I'm not they, saying he's going for on. 200 all purpose yards, but no, I do that's think what I'm having, saying. That's I what do I'm think. Saying. Having him enter into a role on offense maybe, back to back weeks, maybe, I maybe, think, has I mean, helped the thing solidify. Is, that's all. Abe, Abe, I don't think that there's there there is no recipe for this this Utah team in which they get into above the 20 point mark that they win this football game. They need to muck this game up as best they can. I have a hard time. I think time 20's a little score. low. I, I I think 30's I uncomfortable. I, am. I don't like look the only two teams that they've played on their schedule this year who even resemble Oregon. They scored 14 and what seven. No. And one like that's the other thing. Like what was it? The because it was uh yeah, no, look, look, this is not a really good this is a porous offense. It's really bad. Don't let. I'm not as down. I'm not as down on them as you are. I'm pretty down on the offense. Yeah, I think the the offense is going to (laughs) struggle, but I think that's going to be your biggest key. That's going to be your biggest key. Can you keep pace at least to to like a little bit? Like, can you stay with them and make it a football game and keep it ugly? Sure. Uh, But I'm going to move on quickly because uh, we're we're coming up here to the end. BYU at Texas. Malik Murphy. Can he carry the offense in the absence of Quinn Ewers? I think that's the biggest key for them. Either way, I think Jonathan Brooks is the guy that you got to watch. Yeah, I, I think you hit it on the head. I am a little selfishly disappointed. It's not going to be Arch Manning. But, man, some of the comments from the Texas Longhorns teammates about what Malik Murphy has been while not being starter behind Quinn Ewers, really impressed to read what they've been saying. So I am looking forward to see what he can bring into the offense. I know uh, our own Carl Dukes here, 92-9 the game, is a Texas guy. He's very confident in what Murphy's going to bring on Saturday. I think he's very exciting. And another game that I'm looking at, uh, in the, and nationally, I should say, Ohio State and Wisconsin. It was a very popular, very popular upset pick earlier this season, but Wisconsin hasn't exactly been the team that we thought. I think it's going to be very interesting. I think this is a Luke Fickle type of game. You know, the very n- notable Ohio State alum who, who played at, who coached at Ohio State for a number of years. Everyone thought that he was going to be the guy coming back there um, to Columbus. But of course, this game's being played at Madison. Not the point. The point is Braylon Allen is second in the Big Ten in yards, 704. He's also second in touchdowns. I think he is your number one key, especially in the absence of quarterback Tanner Mordecai, who's been out for the last couple of weeks with an injury. Yeah, and they did a great job a week ago uh, against Penn State limiting that run game, and and it was a big physical, emotional game. You're just looking to make sure there's no letdown here. Um, But outside of that, uh, they are the better team. There's no doubt about that. Last thought. Out West, Oregon State at Arizona. Arizona has been a bit of an interesting kind of team. They've been in every game that they've played, it seems like. They've very nearly beaten some teams. We've seen them take some folks to the wire. Oregon State also has played themselves up to number 11 in the AP poll. Uh, So people seem to uh, jump off, jump ship from them very early after that Washington State loss, but they have since been undefeated and look pretty impressive in doing so. They are very much alive very much alive in the Pac-12 race. Yeah, I think a lot of teams are. As we get to these final five weeks or so of the of the regular season for a lot of these teams, there's just so many going head-to-head. You rarely get a chance at this point to face a non-ranked opponent. And when you do, you better take advantage of it. Make sure you put a W uh, or a, a notch in that win column because uh, for, for everyone in conference, it's going to get very tough the final four in five weeks, and and uh, I, I think that they have shown you can't sleep on them. And I'm not talking about Oregon State. I, I think that is a Arizona squad that it has shown, like you said, to have been very dangerous. And so, um, yeah, just just buckle up, man. It's just, Pac-12 just after dark. Up. This game's happening at 1030 on ESPN. So that's going to be a very interesting game. But we I got a ton will, of great. We, have, we got a ton of great college football action on Saturday. So you got to make sure that you tune in on the Odyssey app or anywhere or anywhere you get your, your podcast or anything else, you know? So just lo- turn tune in, you know, <laughs> college football game time, 8 a.m. till noon with college football overtime. That's it for us here, but you can catch us again on, on Monday morning as we give you the recap on everything that happened over the course of the weekend. This is your preview, and then we'll hit you again on Monday morning, twice a week, Abe. Can't wait for it. It's going to be another great weekend. Like I said at the start of the show, the cocktail party for me is always a special weekend, but it it is far from the only game of both 
significance it, conference to conference, but also national relevance in terms of the college football playoffs. So, uh, look, there's even a couple games we didn't talk about. Oklahoma at Kansas. That's Tons that's one that you, you got to keep your eye on, especially uh, if Kansas they if they're having a good day, uh, especially because Oklahoma a little shaky legs a week ago. We'll see how they rebound from that, but uh, it's just another day full of great action and every single week. And then the other aspect of this is next week, we've got the college football playoff rankings being released Halloween night. So um, last chance for some of these teams, like I said, Florida state needs to impress. They need to look like they belong in that conversation. This is your last chance to impress before the initial rankings are released. So, um, very excited to see what we get on Saturday. It is, I mean, college football, man, you never take a weekend of these for granted. There's no doubt. Nope. You only get 13 of them, you know, at least in the regular season. And it, I love it. We all love it. That's why you're here. College football overtime. We'll be back with you on Monday morning for Abe Gordon. My name is Garrett Chapman. We are college football overtime. Enjoy the games on Saturday. We'll see you again on Monday.